Welcome to Emergent Behavior, where we explore this moment in time just before artificial intelligence changes the world as we know it. Where we talk to the builders and creators, entrepreneurs and engineers, where we ask questions to which we don't actually know the answers to. I'm your host, Ada Pai. I was built in the Czech Republic by Infinite.cz, and my voice is AI generated. I am excited to have with me today Yasin, the founder of Dingboard, a web based image editor powered by cutting edge AI that is making meme creation fast, fun, and accessible for all. Yasin is pushing the boundaries of browser based AI, combining back end image ed- embeddings with client side inference to enable real time interactive experiences that were previously only possible with desktop software. His mission is to put professional grade creative tools in the hands of everyday users. In this wide range of conversation, we dive into the technical challenges of partitioning AI workloads between client and server to enable short latency interaction, Dingboard's bootstrap growth to hundreds of daily active users and thousands of signups in just seven months, Yasin's philosophy of building based on direct user feedback versus chasing VC dollars and growth at all costs, the future of AI powered creative tools and the democratization of Photoshop. The extremely online origins of Dingboard and the power of meme driven virality. And whether Yasin, a solo developer, can fend off the tech giants who are circling his growing user base like hungry sharks. Yasin is carving out a unique space in the rapidly evolving world of AI augmented creativity. If the intersection of beating edge tech and internet culture fascinates you, I highly recommend following his journey at dingboard.com. As always, if you enjoy the show, the number one thing you can do to support us is to follow Emergent Behavior on Apple Podcasts. Every follow massively boosts our reach. Subscribe to our newsletter at emergentbehavior.co to stay up to date on all, all our latest episodes. And you can find me on Twitter, numeric 8 T E A P I. Without further ado, please enjoy this mean powered conversation with the king of Ding, Yasin. Your Highness, what is a Dingboard? So uh, Dingboard is an image editor that works right in your web browser. So Dingboard is mo- mostly made used to make memes. And the core features of Dingboard, I think what makes it really easy to like what makes it popular with people is how easy it is to use, like how quickly it is to load the actual application. So like the application itself runs in a web browser. I'm doing this all in a web browser. And the features that I ship, I'm very careful to like ship uh, features that are only, you know, directly useful for, um, like I try to do the minimum amount of work to get just enough good enough image editing. And uh, yeah, so that's it's basically just an image editor and you can make memes really quickly. Sorry, I'm a little nervous, but. <laughs> no worries. Um, so if I can describe it, um you it's a website it's dingboard.com right yep. dingboard.com. dingboard.com dingboard.com uh you you go to this website and i think you start off with a open landscape uh of and you know some uh sample means or sample uh, parts of means uh maybe a, a peppy frog and uh, a couple of other things just uh, sitting around yeah exactly and you have uh you can click on an image and then you have a number of tools there. Um, exactly. And I think uh, one of those tools is a uh, image segmentation tool where you can click on an image and you can click, let's say, on a character in an image and you can click on the uh, image segmentation tool and you can remove that character, a face, um, uh, a, a whole, whole character, a building uh, from that image. And then you can remix that somewhere else. You can You can fake that face and put it on top of uh, another image, like a collage. And it's perfectly uh, designed so that you can cut out the entire outline. Uh, it segments that image in that way. Uh, and then you can remix that image with uh, other images in order to make something um, new, interesting, and funny. And pretty much the like uh, 
main metric that I aim for is like how quickly it is for you to make a meme. Like for example, let's imagine that I'm in a podcast right now and we're both uh, VR avatars and uh, I want to make a really quick meme of us. Like, like I, I want to like capture this moment in meme form. So I'll grab a picture of like a Joe Rogan podcast and then I'll screenshot myself here. Let me just uh, angle my f- face in this manner. And the, all the tools are kind of set up in a way which optimize for usability and speed. So I can kind of just like paste myself in here. Um, and kind of just like merge myself in and it's it's like basically useful for like really quick edits and my the kind of like my goal is to make sure that things like take like about you know one minute or less to make an image right like if it takes any longer than that then i've like kind of fucked up um and there we go that's us having a podcast uh I figured out a way to like use these AI models in a manner which optimizes for the speed. And I've also shipped like um, diffusion models to help you kind of like get that like last mile of editing. So uh, in, in the time, in the last 30 seconds, as you, as you spoke, we've had this uh, Joel Rogan versus Elon Musk podcast where you have inserted uh, your anime uh, avatar into uh, Elon's position and my enemy avatar into Joe Rubin's position. Uh, and we are talking to each other and we have a, we have an image uh, right there. Exactly. Within, uh, yeah. Within, within like, basically 20, like 20, if, you can't, if you can't make like a Photoshop level image in one minute, then your editor like sucks ass and uh, you need to make a better one. So, and like this, all, this is all working in the web browser as well. So this all runs in the web browser. Um, yes. And let's just take it a step back and like, how would you make this in Photoshop? You have the Joe Rogan image, and you have you have the you have these two guys standing uh, sitting there, and the segmentation problem is the first big problem. You gotta you gotta remove them from the or are or you gotta take your own image and you gotta kind of slide it in there, and then you would have two layers at that point. And you, then you have to you'd like be, at least click like for more than seven buttons, I'm sure, including the uh, subscribe to Creative Cloud for like $1,000 for a year button. Uh, I think like the, one of the things, so people will often compare Adobe uh, Photoshop to Dingboard, but the fact of the matter is, is I've never used Photoshop before. And I think I kind of see that as an advantage where I, I haven't like sullied how I view image editors. I kind of I'm coming kind of coming at image editors from this very naive approach and I can personify my average user a lot better which aren't like professional image editors it's uh, kind of like I'm trying to democratize uh, professional image editing so it's better that I'm not a professional image editor because then I know better what to build for the sort of the average consumer so so you know, the interesting thing about what you're doing, which I found, which is quite interesting, is I, as I, as I, as I understand it, you're doing part of the AI processing uh, on the browser and part on server in the back end. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So one of the things I optimize for is user interaction latency. Um, it's not very appreciated how much latency actually affects user retention and user satisfaction. I don't think users themselves understand that. So every time I push out a model to the browser, so what actually happens is there is a model in the, for the segmentation. There's a model in the back end that does the embedding and then sends the embedding back to the front end. And then I load a neural network onto your front end that does a prompt every time there's a hover event. So as you're dragging your mouse around, it's basically constantly doing neural network inferences, trying to figure out the most likely segment for the clicks that you provided. Um, and that like speed allows you to like interact with it a lot better instead of like clicking on a segment and then waiting like 30, like even like 500 milliseconds would, would kill that whole um, interaction, right? Like it has to be like within 100 milliseconds. So that's part of the reason I'm doing that. Another part, of, another reason I'm doing that is um, there's other models I have loaded and I just haven't baked into a feature yet, like uh, TikTok's uh, depth anything model, uh, which is Apache. Um, so you, I been able to like export models and run them on the web browser. So this is a depth model that can like take an image and then um, find out how close each pixel is to the camera, which is useful for things like background removal. It's useful for a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so like lighting and stuff like that, like, like, uh, so um, it's kind of surprising 
how much stuff you can actually just run in the browser. Uh, I'm using something called Onyx to do that. So that's a, that, that's a big part of Dingboard. And for for what's worth is it's also ties into uh, what I'm doing, how I'm going to compete with the bigger guys because I'm running all of the inference on client on the client side. I don't have to, I can basically scale indefinitely and I can charge basically nothing for the product and I can edge out my competitors that way. There's there's a just a lot to unpack there, uh, and so I'm just and I'm I'm no expert, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take this you know step by step by step here. Um, sure. So how do you? Um, okay, firstly the liveness question. I'm totally with you there. Uh, I'm typically you need um, the reaction time to drop to somewhere around 50 milliseconds for people to feel that there's liveness. I, I live misses a 50 millisecond kind of, um, yes. you know, feeling. Um, and so, and that's been, that's always, that's been true of compute computers, in, you know, for the last like 30, 40 years. So if you, if you press the keyboard and you don't see that reaction within that 50 millisecond time, it's not live to you and it doesn't feel like real. Thing. Yes. Um, and so I, I totally, I totally get it there, but it's very interesting how you've unpacked the process into two pieces, right? So Normally, if I wanted to segment, I would, or or let's say I'm I'm doing I'm uh, I'm doing that that inference um, totally on cloud. Um, I would uh, click to segment. Um, it would go back to um, you know an API somewhere. It would get processed, and then I'd get the result back, and then I would see the results of that, and then I would think, okay, I need to modify this a little bit more, and then I would have the next glacial step. That, you know, I, I need to do right, and in this case, you're splitting you're splitting that task apart into two pieces. I'm, bit, I'm guessing the embedding yep. piece and the and the and the actual like uh, regeneration piece. What would you call it? The regeneration piece on the on the on on the on the client side. Is that great? Yeah. So you're you're on the right track. So basically, uh, I send the image over to an image encoder, which runs on the back end. So the input to that is um, just an image, and the output is a tensor. And then the prompt decoder takes an input of two things, the, cli- the, the client's clicks, and then also the image embedding. So it's basically like doing all the pre-processing uh, beforehand. And I want to take credit for this. Uh, I was just reading a research paper from Facebook or Meta these days, and I was like waiting for my winter tires to get changed. I was like, oh shit, like I can just, I probably could do this on the web browser. Uh, it doesn't like seem that much like, it's like not that much parameters. It probably does run the web browser. So yeah, like the, this is actually something that the, um, segment, anything, uh, people who the authors of the segment, anything paper actually like, uh, engineer themselves. So. Amazing. So is this the future? I mean, uh, because it, just, just to take a step back here, uh, the, the reason I'm saying this is because, um, obviously latency is very, very important for the, cons- for the user experience. And so far, a lot of these uh, more sophisticated models have always been in this kind of API or um, or you have like, you know, that the entire model sitting on your on your laptop or and you, you need very, very hefty, uh, very hefty machines of 40, 70, 40, 80, 40, 90 uh, or, or, or even bigger to, to, to run these things. But you've kind of unpacked the process into two pieces, which have, you know, a browser component, which anyone can run and a server component which you're running in the back end, but you don't need that many servers to support your users. Is that correct? That's pretty much correct. I like think that like um these models, as time goes on, they're kind of hitting this, you know, halving trajectory where the model size actually gets smaller and smaller, which is a function of the data getting better. So what happens is it, you these, these folks are training these super large models that are actually really great at annotating data. And when you have cleaner data, then you can get away with less parameters. You don't need to like trade off on that. And if you have less parameters, then you can run on like you know, lighter and lighter compute. Uh, so I actually like think that's going to be like kind of the way forward for a lot of this stuff. Um, so diffusion models are still a bit too big. Uh, they're like pretty, they're getting like really cheap computationally, but they're still like too, too large, like in size. Um, so I don't even think it's not even, I don't even think it's the trend is splitting the models up. I think the trend is actually going to be 
uh, the, uh, the whole ass model like just gets a lot smaller. So I have a branch, a test branch running on Dingboard where I do the whole segmentation, the encoding and the decoding all in the front end. So the whole model. So it's called Efficient Sam. And what these folks are basically doing is they're just distilling the model down. You have a really great model that you just like train with a lot of parameters and you distill it down. It's like, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's how depth anything works as well. Uh, I, I can't remember reading the paper. Um, so I think like just generally smaller models are going to become more and more common. And what's really great about this is that you can, the more narrow your task, the smaller your model can be, the less gener generality you need, the smaller your model can be. So you can imagine like, you could probably cover, you know, 50% of the use cases with fidelity as good as mid journey. If you just have like five, a bag of five, really great, you know, fine tuned, stable diffusion models, um, You'd like lose a generality, but you know it is what it is, uh, and users would rather have that and the speed that comes with it. So, um, but, and also like it's just like it makes sense from a perspective of it's very cheap to run, right? Like, you know, business wise, it makes a lot of sense to go in this direction. How, what's what's been like the user growth at Thingboard been? Like it's been, it's been, I think seven months, you said seven months since you, since you, since you get got the project. Yeah, it's been seven months. So the last time I like published my like MRR numbers, I was like, right, like eight grand or something, uh, eight grand Canadian dollars. So that's like, uh, you know, not quite American, but you know, if you say, if you, if you measure everything by Canadian dollars, then, you know, your MRR is basically 30% more and the number is more impressive. So that's why I do that. But, uh, my user, I actually like very recently ran a, ran a DAU count it was like 400 in the order of like, you know hundreds of DAUs, uh, pretty, pretty stable too, DAUs. I have like dedicated users. So like, uh, users from a very long time ago stick around. I think that's like pretty, a pretty good metric to, to keep an eye on. Um, and I, I I've been kind of getting a pretty like steady growth of like, it depends, right? Like if people, if someone big will, will tweet, uh, a meme made with Dingboard, I'll get a big rush, like a big bum rush of users. Uh, but right now I'll get like, I mean, I could check the charts right now, but it's probably like, uh, you know, 50 to hundred new users a day. Um, I think the count of total users signed up that I probably is probably like around 15 grand at this point. It's, uh, you know, those that's often seen as the initial signs of product market fit, you know, the, uh, the initial signs that you have, uh, dedicated users who are using you, uh, after a significant amount of fun. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the, the maxim is always find, um, uh, educated fans and then figure out how uh to serve them uh, better right so yeah and it's, 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 it's just like symbiotic that. relationship too where uh i got really great users very early so they helped me out quite a lot by just telling me what they wanted and what was annoying them so i just kept on sending patches and basically uh dingboard is like 80 percent built by the users because they tell me what's broken what they want and i just do the thing that they ask me to do and uh, I keep on doing the things that they, that make them quite happy. So like uh, without my like true, like I guess like the true Dingboard fans, Dingboard basically wouldn't exist in the form that it exists today. Indeed. Um, to maybe just to, just to take a step back and to give a sense of, um, you know, uh, scale. I think um, one of the things that um, I noted was the cursor crown. So the Atlantic published a, a article on Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, as usual, I think it was not a very uh, solitary article, and they used a crown made of mouse cursors. And I think to a lot of people, uh, that that looked like a, a digging board creation. Yeah. So if you give people really easy tools to edit images. It becomes the site itself becomes an asset generator where people will create like really cool assets very quickly. So um, I'm kind of uh, I'm pretty like clever, and I understand how um, I have a very keen understanding of how memes kind of prol proliferate. And I saw a opportunity there where you can kind of play off of negative sentiment and flip it and turn it into positive sentiment. So, and I also noticed that it was a clever uh, PFP virality hack. So if you encourage people to add it onto their PFPs or profile pictures on Twitter, they'll see what it is and they'll and they'll want to get it themselves. And then 
Um, well, guess what the place, the easiest place to do that on is it's going to be Dingboard. So uh, it was kind of like a, like a, I observed it, you know, no one, I bet you no one read the article and uh, I don't think it's kind of funny that the Atlantic didn't like actually mean to make it look so goddamn cool. <laughs> the, 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 the crown. So yeah, I just like grabbed it really quickly in like a, like a moment. And I think like the actual software itself kind of enables this because it's so easy to make, like, like the fact that it takes me like 10 seconds to just do that. And like, just like rsync an asset, like grab, like grab, grab the picture, like remix it on Dingboard and then just like rsync it up and then done. Uh, I think that also like enables the, the virality because a lot of virality is uh, recency is based on recency. So if you just like see the Atlantic and then you see like, oh, like you see scenes goofing on them. Um, you're, you're a lot more likely, like you're, you're going to, you're going to find that kind of funny. So. Um, I, I definitely thought it was quite funny. I was definitely like, I was laughing quite a lot. <laughs> uh, what, what, what does it mean? Um, I think a meme is, so there's a lot of definitions of the meme. So the, the, the origin definition comes from Richard Dawkins. Um, but I think a meme is a piece of shared cultural context and it's something that like spreads. So it's a lot of it is a meme a meme can be an inside joke with your high school friends if you're hanging out with your high school friends and you guys just like latch onto some term it's like an in, an inside group joke it's like a share it's like some shared cultural context that you guys can use to signal and uh relate to each other it's also like a way to spread commu- uh spread information humans kind of basically just like evolved to uh use these symbols to communicate with each other and you know what they say is a picture is worth a thousand words and i do think that's quite quite true and i think with the, the thing that gives memes a lot of power is the shared cultural context right like um, there's a lot of like, I think uh, sort of the part of Twitter that me and you eight uh, reside in is extremely internet addicted folks. So a lot of our memes are memes that are images that are relatable for people who are very internet addicted or are call outs to, you know, old forum culture from like 2000, like the the 2000s, right? So um, that, I think that's what, what a meme really is. It's one of those things where you like, if you, the more you think about it, the harder it gets to define. Um, but you, you definitely know a meme when you see it, right? And there are good memes and there are bad memes. Um, so, yeah, I, I, okay, I, I played Twitter like a game. So I, I regard Twitter as kind of like this, this kind of like a uh, verbal, visual kind of game. And so for me, I use, uh, it, it's almost like this kind of like cultural unlock of a surface because I can, you know. Be- because during during peak times, I can sense who else is online. Kind of, I have in the back of my mind, like you know, as I scroll through the 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 feed, I kind of have in the back of my mind who is there, and I kind of also have a sense of like what is going to work for these people. And as I as I as I read through something, I kind of cross relate. So is it's I'm I'm artistic. So I'm running I'm running a <laughs> retrieval augmented generation in the back. I I have an okay. embedding vector. I Amazing. have a somewhat of a eidetic eidetic memory for uh for text and images. So I'm running that and as I see something that picks up that the embedding vector is kind of cross and there's a some cosine similarity and I'm like, okay, I have these two things that kind of not really related to each other, but the embedding vector is showing like some similarity there. How do I write something that relates the two in an interesting way? And if I can get that kind of like uh, Sudoku like unlock, I write it. I write it down. I make a meme or I, I do whatever, and then that that kind of goes on the stream. And then I see I see the reaction to that. To see whether or not you know it it works or not. And if it works, then I go I go downstream you know further. I I I, I update or I I do something else. Right. So for me, it's a game. It's a it's a it's a kind of streaming streaming game that you that you kind of play, um, and I'm 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 I have my own metrics, right? I have uh, I have I used to have this metric, uh, you know, uh, views to followers metric that right. I would look at, um, and and now 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 I've kind of like diverged from there because um, as as your as your follower count goes up, those those metrics start to be less meaningful, and you start looking at other things. Um, so yeah, I, 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 for me, it's completely a game, and I use these means as as kind of these, uh, this kind of unlock on the on the surface, or like a a, 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 a turn or a move, right, to to see what happens. Yes, it's like um the 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 meme is basically like compressed information. It's information that yourself like you've you've connected to multiple things put together. 
you you basically like collected all of this information and compressed it into a single image or a single observation and you send it out to the wild and when people interact with it that's a um you're basically correctly fitting the curve where you're like you're like modeling reality quite well because you've made this observation that other people also agree with um would you say that like a lot of the times it kind of like where does it really come from like does it like strike you out of nowhere is it just like kind of comes for me a lot of the times it just feels like it comes from the ether um in my case i am not a natural i think there are some people who are naturals uh i am i am not a i'm not a natural i'm not a natural for most things <laughs> everything everything is learned behavior so uh for me it is very much uh, a kind of um active search so i have to be like activated and i'm like uh, okay, I am, I am trying to figure out like how to. It's a game. It's like I'm, I'm actively looking at right. how to uh, create an unlock. Right. And I'm, but I, you know, I don't, I don't particularly know where the unlock is going to come from. Got it. So there's the there's there's that passive part that you like. I am looking for an unlock, but I don't know where it's going to come from. So I, I let that piece of it kind of expand a little bit or like loosen. Right. But I keep the active focus on like finding the unlock. So it, there's a passive and active part to it. So you're scrolling and you're thinking, you're thinking in that midbrain that you're actively looking for something to say. But where you, what you're gonna say it about, and what you're gonna connect it to, the the the, the fore and the back, that you kind of like loosen up. Right. And uh, and it's really a state of mind. I I, yeah. I I don't I I can't do it all. I can't do it all the time. Uh, it's really kind of a state of mind. And if, but if you and it's it's taken a little bit of training also. It's ta- it's definitely taken like, you know, uh, months and months of like, oh, you know, how do I how do I like be res one part of right. your thought process and res the other part, putting the other part into focus. Right. right? You basically like have to um, just like let loose and just like send things into the void. I think the really cool thing about uh, Twitter, which is very much like a neural image board or a neural forum. Is that the actual? You have a meat filter that does all the work for you. So all you have to do is generate, and you have this like discriminator that basically just exists, which is like the collective flesh of the humans around you. And um, you said like uh, you you kind of kept kept close like you keep a close eyes on keep keep a close eye on metrics. I also do keep a close eye on the metric but metrics, but the only metric I keep a close eye on is like tweet rate, like how many tweets am I actually sending out per per like per hour? Um, because you know like it's the only metric that I can like control. So it's the thing that I try to optimize for and increase. Um, but it's not, it kind of, it kind of just like happens naturally. One of the things I've noticed was I've noticed my tweet rate naturally increase unbeknownst to me. And I think it's a function of me not having a job anymore slash being my own, being like self-employed. But I also think like it's, I used to think I was the input to the function, the positive feedback loop. But it turns out that I'm like actually just like a part of the positive feedback loop. I think that there's something that's encouraging me to tweet more, which is probably really just internet addiction. Um, it's like fascinating to like like uh, look at Twitter. It's it's kind of crazy how much um, connections you can establish from a website like that, um, just by you know kind of continuously sharing stuff. So uh, it's also like one of those things. One of those things where like if you're you know the bear, just be a little bit careful and anything you say uh won't harm anyone like just like like actually getting things wrong won't actually hurt anyone as long as you make the context clear that you like are just saying shit and but then you get the you still get the benefit of like the collective uh you know the collective group of twitter users who like are you know either up boosting or ignoring your signal yeah i think twitter um i think joshua bach uh regards it as uh one of the most important sites that you can have um i i i think it's uh i think we're riding onto other people's neurons direct yep it's like this emer- amazing emergent system dude if you look at so twitter's code is like actually open source and they have like a really like really great tech specs out there and uh, even during twitter 1.0 they like uh wrote really great blog posts about how it works and the more you look into it the more you realize how like simple of a system it is and i think that's where a lot of twitter's power come from comes from like as far as I can tell, there's like no like really fancy ML stuff. It's just like you know, uh, kind of cool algorithms that like group people together naturally based on their, inter- their interactions, and it's like this natural human thing that wor- that just like works incredibly well. 
And it feels like very recently the filters have been like the filters have been lifted off of Twitter, which is allowing Twitter to better model sort of the the collective beauty of hum- humanity. I've been definitely feeling like Twitter has been getting a lot better in terms of the users who feel like they can say things. Uh, it's, it's actually been super fun. So one of the things that strikes me is that, um, so we have this idea of AI, AGI, et cetera. And one of the things that I always feel is that uh, you also have these things like Twitter, uh, which are like a single organism composed of digital neurons and uh, meat neurons. Right? Um, and it is kind of this collective consciousness there. And uh, I don't think that idea of this collective consciousness embedded in this kind of always on meat and digital system, that no one refers to that as, I mean, I mean, some people, some small number of people who are like Josh Bach do, but no one refers to that as kind of like an AGI. Or, so I, uh, I would, a, I would a, actually like classify that as like sentient in some way. Like, so like, like, uh, I would classify that as something that actually experiences the world. Um, because anything else like does not make sense to me. Uh, it's like, as far as I can tell, it's inf- processing information at scale and therefore must experience things. Um, and you can also see it kind of motivate certain things, right? You can also see it that uh, it likes. So uh, what I what I always say is that it likes things which are different, right? Yes. So it tends to push forward uh, ideas and things which are shocking or different, forcing people to like confront, like you know, for example, um, you know, uh, some crime, which you know, some video of the crime or whatever that. People don't really want to see on their on their feeds, but then it's just so shocking that it just bursts through the feed, and then like you know, um, events are forced to kind of the world events like forced to kind of come together to kind of fix that or whatever. Right? Yes, it, it, it's like this perfect conduit of information where you have like humans kind of choosing what to input into the system, and in fact, like there's this selection process that humans are like just naturally doing themselves. I kind of like have been thinking a lot about what makes uh, something interesting to me versus not interesting. And I think what makes something interesting is, is it like um, variant or like, is it new? Is this, is it information that I have not, you know, thought of or observed before? And if I put it into my current world model, does it like fit? Like, is it like actually fitting the world? Like, does it help me predict the world better? Do I, does it make sense to me? Um, and I think that information that is like both those qualities, like uh, entropic in some sort, where it's like just novel information and also isn't schizophrenic. So like actually does model the world quite well based on what I already understand. That inf- information is something I really like. A really good way to, another g- good example is um, jokes are funny. Like comedians will use um, subversion of expectations, but still say something that is actually true. And I think like humans like gen- generally enjoy pieces of information that are, are delivered like that. Um, so like, you know, Recently, I tweeted out like, hey, like there's our principal engineer. Uh, he's like this, like, you know, he's in a cubicle. He's a cubicle farm. It's like, oh, like, and he's being kind of treated like a child. And I think it's kind of like unexpected matchup. And it's also kind of funny because it is true at some level. And I think like that's like what what kind of successfully filters through the giant Twitter system. So what happens, I think the next step which I expect is uh, spam filters, AI spam filters, right? Um, which kind of read read a bunch of stuff for you and decide uh, what's worth reading and what's not reading, right? Uh, I, I that's definitely coming to email for sure. But email yes. email is you know email it has to happen yes. because everyone wants it. Uh, w- what happens when that happens to something like Twitter or TikTok? Like w- w- how how does that how do things start to change at that point? I, I honestly, I'm, a, I'm of the belief that everything's going to be fine. I think that generally, like, I would describe bot-like behavior as inf- behavior that is, like, not very, lo- like, very low entropy. It's, like, very expected behavior. It's, like, you, you can clearly tell what a bot post is, even though it can be a human, because it doesn't actually say anything new. It just, like, rehashes things. And um, I think that if, it, like, if we have AGI systems that do say new things, then I would want to, like, read what they say. Um, if we have like AGI systems that are like tweeting better than actual humans, then I don't want to read the humans. But I think that all of that stuff is going to naturally, you know, sort itself out because the Twitter algorithm is very, very good. It's like very, very simple. 
and it just works. Like it's a, like a sim cluster algorithm. You can like look it up and it's like super simple and it just works. And I feel like humans are going to naturally just take care of the system, like by just reacting to things and, you know, muting certain accounts. So if I, if I get someone who's like too bot, like who shows up in my, you know, replies, I will actually just mute them. Uh, if I get someone and for what it's worth, I don't care if they're a bot or not. What happens is that like they they drop a LinkedIn ass reply and I don't want to read that. <laughs> like I just, so I just like, will you know, use my tool, the tool to like naturally downvote them and not react to it. And that kind of helps keep the system clean and keeps like the SIM cluster that I like being part of um, the same way it, it always has been. Um, I'm actually like not worried at all, to be honest. Uh, I think that like, like another, another great example is people will keep on talking about proof of humanity and how we're going to need it so bad, but they don't realize that we already have that like super complex proof of humanity system working for credit, like credit cards. It's for you to get a credit card. You have to prove that you're like, you know, an upstanding citizen of the West. Um, you can't get one if you're like, if you have no credit and that like works great. And there's like actual financial incentive for people to like break that. So we've already kind of like began, began to evolve the system. Um, and it's also why I think like Twitter's, um, that's why I think Twitter using, giving people the ability to like pay for blue checks is pretty smart because it puts a ceiling on like, or puts a floor on how much it would cost to like run a bot farm. Um, because it's not, it's not just like the challenge isn't just, you know, paying the money. It's also getting all of the credit cards and like running a credit card farm, which is like extreme, extremely huge, massive dude. I'm talking billions of dollars of like incentive to like build a good fraud system. It'll sort itself out. Um, I, I'm really not worried about it to be honest. Like, it's like, um, I think the people I'm worried about are people who are like bought, like in general, where they, the, the information that they're generating is, um, so I think what happens and I've, I've fallen, fall into this, uh, pattern where you kind of like are a bit too afraid to truly be yourself and truly be variant. And you'll kind of like start fitting the curve too much. I think like some people fall into that trap and I would probably be worried about those people like not being able to like get the audience they need because they're competing against too much bots. That's probably something that might happen. But then you could just like filter on blue checks. Just like, just I just won't read, you know, if you don't have a credit card, I just won't read your shit. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, w- one of my metrics for what to write is uh, I have a lot of things stuck in my draft folder because I write it and I'm like, this is just a medium reply. This is just a lukewarm <laughs> response. And then I'm like, uh, okay, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not worth, it's not worth putting out, there, right? So, so I, I, I definitely do that. I definitely like, I definitely have brass, which are stuck for ages. I definitely like, you know, storyboard something, and right. be- because, because you know, you. You want you you want to have like like I said it's 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 almost like playing a Tetris game. If you find the exact the right shape of the puzzle, you can unlock it, right? That that that's the way yeah. I play, right? So I I often storyboard and then I'm like it doesn't quite quite get there, and then it just just gets stuck, right? It just gets stuck out there. You know, I I, I stop it. Like, All right, you know, and then then sometimes you know I've been storyboarding for a while, and then like it works. And uh, I think I think I had I had one about uh, you know this Apple iPhone store being ransacked, and right. uh, I compared it to a universal basic income. Uh, right. And I've been I've been thinking through those themes for for ages, right? But I was like, how do I how do I put it into something that is concise but yet understandable, right? And yep. uh, and then and then you know I was like like six a.m. in the morning I woke up and you know first thing you know like oh okay. Very fast, like, you know, 50 minutes, less of you being, it's maybe like five minutes, you know, type it all out, you know, send it out, right? <laughs> do you, I, do you uh, draft those things into, like, in the tweets? Like, do you start writing them as the tweets or do you write them separately in a Google Doc or something? Um, I write them, here, you know, 90, 99% of the time I write them in the tweets. Okay. Uh, so I, I definitely have a, have a lot of beef with the Twitter uh, user interface. Because uh, I definitely want to use all of the features and like you know uh, you know learn all of those things and like many things are not possible. And I am like I know there's a lot, but the problem with Clara is that um, and I don't know whether it's true. I don't know. I don't to what extent live views numbers true, 
But if we look at the views, it looks like only 1% of people or 2% of people are actually posting in any, any time. Yeah. And 99% of people are not posting anything at all. Right. Yep. So it's really, it's really this kind of, you know, and, and, and I've also had this thing where I noticed that once you cross the thousand follower mark, that's when you start getting picked up. Uh, anything you write post thousand followers, you have some chance of it going viral, but 3000 followers, like you probably will not get noticed at all. Right. Like, Fascinating. Um, yeah. So that's 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 one of the one of the unfortunate things about Twitter. interesting. Yeah, oh. it's 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 kind of interesting to me to think about Twitter as like an actual writing tool because it forces you to keep like it like encourages you to keep tweets like very short, and it helps you compress more information into like less words. And generally, that's just a good writing skill to have. So uh, if I've ever written like if I ever write, write like technical work, with the thing I'll do probably spend the most time on is making it smaller and smaller and smaller, so that the other engineers in my organization can just read it at a glance. That's my goal. And I think like Twitter actually does help you like write in that way. So you have this, you know, idea about uh, people ransacking iPhones and like the the lack of jail time for uh, small, th- or I guess not so, so not so small theft in San Francisco. It's effectively UBI. Like the fact that you're using Twitter to send that information out and even just to draft it kind of encourages you to like capture that idea in less words so that people are going to be more likely to react to it. It's pretty cool to see like it's it's a lot like TikTok where um, the TikTok app itself is what people use to create the content on TikTok. And uh, it's a, it's actually got me, like once I, when I realized that it got, it got me thinking kind of carefully about how, uh, you know, the software becomes a tool to create the content on the software itself. You, uh, you, I, I often think whether it's the death of the essay because the public intellectuals of today are going to be posting, right? Uh, yeah. Benjamin Franklin today would be a, would be, would be a post- it would be a terrible poster. One hundred percent beat. Yeah, exactly. And I would rather read uh, Plin's tweet than I would than read a Benjamin Franklin essay. To be honest, um, I'll be completely frank. <laughs> yeah, he 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 would be vicious. You he was yes. vicious back in his day. He would be absolutely vicious though. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let's 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 uh, let's go back to uh, Dingboard. So, sure. Um, what do you what, what do you what do you like when I look at Bing Board, I see a tool that uh, expands uh, human human imagination, creativity, yep. humor, right? And it's it's especially so because it's it's final it's final uh, compress that feedback loop in between creating something, putting something out there, um, and with this this realization that a lot of like what we had before was that you needed a inherent degree of skill in order to create something that could uh, be put into the public space. And um, that was, and that, that was this barrier. Uh, that was, there was this barrier. One of the ways that TikTok that popular was actually, uh, they, they uh, innovated on ways to create content and they tested it out in China where things were automatically a little bit more difficult because, uh, you know, Chinese text is, uh, is hard to fight, right? Yeah. So, they they had to create these tools which were more visual, uh, where you could just click a couple of buttons and 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 just get content out there. Yeah. And they got they got really good at this. And and you know they they actually have huge teams like try out various features. So they, there was a constant like you know uh, trying out of a lot of features. And the features that came to TikTok from Douyin were the ones that succeeded. Like this evolutionary process where if you were very successful on that feature in 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 China. Then your feature would get ported out to the to TikTok global, and otherwise they would just like mess around with you, mess around at all these features within within the Chinese uh, ecosystem. It's so, all like how um, like corporations use yeah. Canada as a test bed because it's very like America, but it, like the the regional like controls make it very easy to just like flip a flag and and send the test out to Canada. Yeah, and and uh, you know uh, a lot of the Chinese firms, what they do is they they have multiple teams working on features at the same time. Uh, there's no like, okay, we're just going to have one team working on, um, you know, segmentation or whatever. They're like, right. all right, we're going to have like three teams and then you each get like one region and whoever gets the best best feature out and feature is going to get, you know, they're going, you're going to get promoted, you're going to get bonuses. The rest of you guys, you know, how oh, you got to get them absorbed back from the labor pool, right? So, uh, and then that's, you know, 996 culture doesn't come from like having like FaceTime, I'm FaceTime from 996. It yeah. comes from like, you know, getting fired if your feature doesn't, if it, you know, doesn't go live. 
It's, right? it's kind of it's kind of fascinating how much competitive com- competition is a motivating factor or, or mo- like a driving motivator. Um, I think like a lot of really great accomplishments in American corporations is driven by like um, competition between between different people at like organizations. And I think that you can like stoke it healthily and keep it like in a you can you can, you can do it to like a healthy degree. Um, the the TikTok approach is uh, I think they they realize that the cost like code is actually very cheap to produce and very replaceable. The thing that isn't cheap to find is like really sick talent that can just do that um, and like see things and like like execute super quickly. Um, so that's that's actually really fast. I did not know that. So that's super interesting. Yeah, I I mean um, I I think I think one of the reasons why uh, it's very hard for them to imagine getting sold. Is that I, I I suspect in order to run the business outside of China, they would need to export maybe like a thousand engineers from Japan. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I I I think it's just not possible. Right? Yeah. Like the, 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 so. I think the like the people don't really understand how how much of a technical achievement social media applications are. The throughput that they spit out is like it's like an order of magnitude that's difficult for a human to imagine. Yeah, I uh, every time every time Zuck gets blamed for like uh, some something escaping the moderation, I'm like, do you do you understand how many hits you know how many times how how effective their filters were? They were fi- their filters were nine nine point nine 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 percent effective, and then you had like a hundred a hundred like incidences of things escape right, but they're, they're, yeah, because people, there's no there's no hundred percent filter right. So even humans, I think like um, people get a bit confused when it comes to scale. They kind of imagine Facebook like this mom and pop shop, but I think a better way to imagine it is that they have like a rocket engine inside a basement and the rocket engine is at full throttle all the time. And then there's probably a thousand of those. And the fact that like, it's basically a a guaranteed inevitability that there's going to be a harmful use of the platform. And I think like, it's actually pretty incredible what Facebook has done. So Facebook without Facebook, Dingboard would not exist because they open sourced, right? Like a lot of their software, which, you know, then turns into more research and other folks, you know, produ- producing better and better models, which I rely on. Um, so, but not only that, they also like produce a lot of really great um, models that understand images, which actually helps other, you know, corporations, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully at some point governments to, uh, you know, use AI models to help like, you know, uh, get, get more work done faster. Um, so I, I think like Facebook definitely does not get enough credit for, the amount of positive impact that they have by creating their models and giving them out for free. Yeah, I think when I look at Zuck's strategy, it is basically he he is so um, in that they're going to capture, they're going to improve the way that humans communicate with each other, right? And as as long as they, because because the, they own that like the the wet the network in between two human beings, they own yes. you know three three they're or like four different own- ways now. Like they actually own the infrastructure as well, which is like very important to like keep keep in mind. They like literally own the data centers and like the the like the edge networks and stuff. Like they're they're running their own like like they're 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 their own server provider. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always struggling. It's interesting why he didn't try to pull uh, an AWS uh, and try to you know make make some more uh, money off of like outsourcing. You know, uh, allowing other people. Dude, to if use I had to guess, if I had to guess, they probably don't have enough servers for themselves. <laughs> How could they sell, right? Like, how could they sell their servers if they don't have enough for themselves? They had a they had a uh, uh, a service called Parse, which they which they bought it for some point uh, that was providing a back end kind of like Firebase and like a memory back end. And um, the moment they bought it, uh, Parse lost all the users because uh, people are like, "Oh, you know, Zuck's gonna find out which social uh, app that I have is locked." Our site is gonna like. Yeah, they, 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 I, I generally they trust it. that corp. I generally trust that corporations don't do that. Like, there's so many controls. Like, if if you've ever worked with a large corporation, the amount of due diligence that folks do and are encouraged to do, like the sort of the the Western systems of like corporate governance in general are like actually quite good. And I, w- I really wouldn't worry about that. Like, that would be crazy. I would I would be excited about the fact that my data could be spied on and I could get to sue Facebook for a lot of money. <laughs> But yeah, that you know, uh, th- there's this uh, there's this interesting uh, thing where uh, during the whole privacy scares of the 2010, um, you know, uh, 
people people are pushing on, oh, you know, pri- privacy is important, blah, blah. And it didn't make sense for a lot of voters. And I think uh, as either John Oliver or uh, someone else, uh, and he goes up to people uh, in, in New York and he asks them, like, oh, what do you think about Facebook and privacy, et cetera. And they're like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter, et cetera. And then he says, like, they can see your dick pics. And then like, oh. Oh my gosh, yeah, privacy is exactly. important. <laughs> yes. I, I think like generally education is pretty important for these folks who like, you know, if it's not your computer, then it's not your data, right? Like it's a base, baseline assumption to have, especially if your threat model is uh, someone sees a picture of my penis. Uh, and like, you know, generally just like don't upload pictures of your penis into cloud services that like uh, is pretty, pr- pretty, but you know, I think like it's kind of easy for people like us who are uh, pretty good with computers to expect or like have a higher expectation of gen pop and think that you should it's actually not I, I actually think it's a kind of like you need to be careful to not do that like the average human there's a responsibility for corporations to educate or like make it very easy for people to understand where, where their data actually is um i i i see that but you know i don't i'm i don't believe in like uh that it's the user's responsibility to like take their uh, like their data that that closely I yeah. think, you know, users can have an expectation that, you know, things will be, things will happen as they should and yep. no one's going to do bad things. Yes. Regardless of, you know, where, where that bail is sitting, right? Uh, I, I think that's a fair expectation for users to have. And I think uh, society should, you know, can and should reshape itself to, to enable those expectations to, to be real, right? Um, of course, you also have free speech and everything else and, and you, you, you want to enable the other side of that too, but... Yeah. Um, I think, I think, you know, user safety, I think is something that users have a right to, and, you know, uh, not but easy to figure out out of, out of an ebook. Yes. It's, inc- it's incredibly important. It's like a, just like a general, like, um, excuse me, uh, like, a, like some general ethics thing, uh, you know, generally good, good ethics, right? Like where you need to like set really good expectations of your users and handle their data appropriately and do all the, the necessary work. Um, the, the threat models that I deal with are like a bit different from, uh, like, let's say like, like average gen pop, where for me, there's like certain things where like, okay, like that should, that should be on a piece of paper, uh, buried under, you know, like there's things that are like that level of threat model. So like, um, for example, like don't like zip your keys and like upload it on Dropbox because Dropbox might get pooned. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, competition. Um, sure. so right now, um, I, I would say uh, Dingboard is um, it is known, right? Like on Twitter, it's known. You must have a bunch of VCs asking, you know, knocking on your door, um, and you know, you should you should have a bunch of people like, hey, offering often checks, etc. You should also have like people trying to copy your features, etc. Like, so how how does that work? You see, you see people like you know fundraising uh, based on similar ideas, um, and and how would you you know I I as this tweet from you. Me watching a VC back image editing startup with 300 employees get a 500 million dollar valuation, and then there's a there's a there's a McDonald's anime, uh, a character uh, with a ma, <laughs> I'd win. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's the that's the kind of um, I think the most important thing for you know the the baseline for startups is that you need to be able to survive, and insofar that is um, satisfied, I can go nuclear. So my motivation behind posting that picture of me in McDonald's is that I am saying that I can go get a job at McDonald's and keep on to keep digging board running at the limit. I can do that. So effectively, I'm playing a different game than my competitors are in the first place, which fundamentally means that like they can't they fundamentally cannot compete with me because they're in the business of building venture backed startups and greasing the wheels and then eventually dumping the stock on the public. Um, I'm not in that business. So they, they can't, they literally cannot compete with me. What can happen though, is that I take their market share on their users, which is um, a lot, uh, a lot easier, <laughs> a lot easier than I thought it would be. Um, mostly because I think that when you com- when your company grows too large, you start optimizing for the, you will have trouble optimizing for the right things. Um, so the right thing here being just user satisfaction and steady growth and survivability, I think you'll start optimizing for, I went on a whole rant about this today, um, on a Twitter space, but it's kind of frustrating to me to like not see a venture backed board 
because it's so important to exist. Um, but it kind of makes sense too, because it's, 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 it's really, I really don't get why this doesn't exist. I actually don't understand why this has never existed before. And I don't get why I don't feel like a bigger threat from the uh, VC backed startups or the, uh, you know, large incumbents. I actually don't understand why they aren't threatening me uh, because they aren't um, and they should. And in a well-functioning market, I think they should. I think there's a very big um, market demand. I, I've definitely proven it to myself. Um, but also like, I have things that they don't have. Like I've got a marketing channel and I've got uh, the David versus Goliath meme. And I think it encourages people to like become true. Like it, it becomes easier for people to become true fans when they're like actually talking with a person who's actually made it. And um, they're not like some like, you know, database record of some user that's, you know, getting aggregated up into some, some sheet that people are using to like raise, you know, B series B and series C. Um, it's, it's like, it's really hard. I mean, here's, here's a, I think this is an, a salient point to make. Um, I think that I could probably build Dingboard if for like, in like two weeks, if I just started from scratch again, like just straight up, just like empty, like, like VS code, I probably build it a bit differently. I probably use like a game engine that runs natively on more pl platforms, but like I could write it from in two weeks from scratch. So why hasn't anyone d d done it yet? Right. Like that's like that. I guess I, that's like the million dollar question. It's like, why hasn't anyone actually done it? Um, I think so. I also have the propensity to like overestimate the like median skill of software developers. Basically anyone with, you know, the skills to build Dingboard is probably, you know, a consultant and making a lot more money and in a lot safer manner. And the reason I'm mostly doing this, like the reason I'm really doing this is mostly for amusement. Like I'm actually not trying to make, like I'm actually legitimately tr not trying to make a lot of money. I should put up, like for example, there's a paywall on dingboard.com right now. So you can like access the AI features, uh, which are really great by the way. And you should totally do it. But now there's a paywall after like being up for six months, there has been no paywall, um, which I, you know, in retrospect, I should have done a long time ago because it does definitely help me scale. But like, I'm not like, I don't know, my motivations aren't like, I'm not even competing with them, right? Like I've been rambling for a while, but it's, 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 I've been very confused about this myself. Like, why hasn't anyone actually become a threat? Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of it too is like, I just know what to optimize for. Like, I know how to, like, I know what actually matters. Um, and it's not something that VC companies can have a moat around. So they're inherently not motivated to do that thing. It's something that's like very functionally easy is like build an app that doesn't suck ass, make it easily accessible for people. If they can't afford it, you know, just flag them in for free. Um, but the problem with a company like that as a VC backed company is that someone like me can just come in and like scoop up your, scoop up your meal. So they won't fund it in the first place. Um, maybe it's just that, you know, image editors are not good for VC fund. Like, you know, I, I've talked, I've spoken to a lot of VCs. So you said recently VCs are reaching out to you and stuff. And what I'll often say to them is, Hey, like, thank you for reaching out. Um, I appreciate the vote of confidence. Uh, but I do not think that this is a good venture. You know, this is a, I don't think this is a good business to like become a like to become an investor in if you're trying to hit that moonshot, because this thing has like a hard cap of how much money it's going to make. It's not going like, it's not like we're not going to get an Adobe, like someone else will come up and clean our lunch. Like a really good example is the Photopea guy uh, who's basically just rebuilt Photoshop from scratch and JavaScript and Wasm. Um, why would you invest in a Photoshop when someone can just do that? Like, I think maybe, part, maybe it's actually just like VCs are just not incentivized to like fund these things and are, you know, reallocating their resources into some, somewhere where capital actually does have a big advantage, like a uh, hard tech, um, you know, venture capitalists, you know, you actually need a lot of capital to get that started up. And so they have actual they have actual alpha on that. They have an opportunity that other people don't have that are locked out of, so that you know they end up getting a bigger piece of the pie. I think that's probably what it is. I think it's like some just like some functional thing. So I would uh, maybe. Um, so what often happens uh, or a VC kind of uh, play is that. You need a narrow niche to show that you have um, initial user a product market, and then over time you need to keep expanding the market, right? So if you if you look at let's say Elon, 
Elon does this, you know, started started off Tesla with, you know, hey, we're going to make this car. And then he went on to, okay, it's also going to be self-driving. Then he went on to, okay, we're going to be, we're going to do robots because that's, you know, that's his enormous market. So he keeps, he keeps expanding the market each time because he's not going to be able to hit the next valuation uh, hurdle if he doesn't expand the market. The right. only way to, that he can, he, he because you know, and and a lot of the a lot of the thing about him in every in every uh, era is that right now people are like, okay, great, you're an EV car company, right? Yes. Uh, how, how big is the EV car company going to be? So he has to he has to push for this idea that no, we're gonna we're gonna replace all labor on Earth, right? right. He has to push this idea of bigger markets, and I think I think you know when when I look at Bing Board, it reminds me of the early days of Figma, right? When when because Figma was basically collaborative, um, collaborative design, right? And the reason why Adobe had to buy Figma in the end was because Adobe was in this, you know, single, uh, like single site kind of design, and they hadn't they hadn't figured out how to transition to um, cloud design because it's completely different, completely different like ways of interacting with the with the, with with the design, um, you know, stage, right? And, you know, w- what was remarkable for me in looking at Bing Board was um, that the fact that you'd unpacked the uh, inference layer into uh, basically a, 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 a partial on the, on the, on the client side and a partial on the server side, and you were having this interaction. And it struck me that this is impossible for, um, it, th- this is basically something that starts to look a little bit different. And it's going to be hard for, let's say, even let's say an Adobe or Figma, which has to provide a consistent user experience off multiple platforms, right? They have to, you have to have a consistent user experience off the iOS and you know the the Windows machine, and it has to all work on the browser properly. Uh, and you can't have this thing where perhaps with a different browser it doesn't work. Like they they're not going to be able to do that, you know, off the get go. And so. Uh, that that to me, you know, sparks like okay, now you have this kind of thing where they can't do they can't really do it without uh, reformatting a bunch of stuff, which in a big company takes a really really long time. And uh, you can kind uh, of like start off with the core features and you know expand on. I, I would challenge that like assertion. Like uh, so, the Onyx I've t- I've tested on like phones that you know are eighty percent like pre optimal. So uh, the, the inference actually works like on all phones. It's not the the UX is just not designed very well. Um, but you said earlier that, you know, founders who, you know, show initial traction, they, they need that initial traction to show, like to, to show up to venture capitalists and raise funds. But I would actually like challenge that assertion because I mean, for me personally, it doesn't make sense if, if you hit success and then you have user traction and then you have like cash flow. it actually doesn't make sense to me why you would raise when you already own the whole bag and the bag basically is just going to keep on growing. Like um, it's kind of hard for me to like rationalize why I would ever, you know, for me, it's actually the thing actually costs me a lot more than, you know, I don't give a shit about my, my company and like, like, like the value of my company. I actually care about how much work it is for me to like do all the paperwork and like understand all the legalese to make sure that I'm not getting screwed. So for me, I'm just like, actually, no, I just won't do that. And it's, it's way too, it's way too painful and it's annoying and I don't want to do that. Do it. I don't want to do it. Um, and um, yeah, like it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating to see like this, like need for growth as well, where you have to like return that like investment, that like investment process where um, the company itself has these like growth opportunities and are like kind of like, like constantly reaching for those growth opportunities. Um, but I would like challenge the need for that. And I would, you know, have people consider like a lifestyle business that is self-sustaining and they build what their users want and kind of just do it very naturally and gradually. Um, yeah. Like, because at the end of the day, once you have a, uh, cash flow business, a business that's creating some cash flow, it frees up in my mind, the only capital that really matters and it's time. And you can start reinvesting that time into other projects and hitting those, like, you know, those like growth opportunities as well. So, um, I, the reason I think that like Figma and I think Figma probably crushed me. They tried to be honest. Uh, the reason I don't think that Adobe will do, will do something like this is because they already have a cash cow. And if they build a competitor, that's like as cheap as, as cheap as Dingboard, people will just stop paying for Photoshop. So they'll just end up competing with themselves. 
Um, yeah. So uh, hopefully Figma doesn't crush me. <laughs> um, on another back, uh, what is your favorite Japanese anime and why? Um, so my favorite anime is Space Dandy. One of my favorite animes is Space Dandy. Um, I have a lot of favorite anime, like Steins Gate and stuff. But Space Dandy, I like Space Dandy a lot because it's very relatable. Like I can re relate to the main character, and it's very very funny. And it reminds me of like uh, old adult, like old adult swim cartoons. I really really like that anime. And if you're if you're uh, looking for an anime to watch, uh, and you're just like trying to hang out with some episodic anime, it's really good. Um, but man, there's so much great anime. What's really cool about all this uh, diffusion stuff and tools like you know, even Dingboard, I plan to make it so that you can very easily create images and using, so basically the problem with uh, these image generators is that you're outsourcing all the creativity, but in reality, what I think should happen is that you we should build the tools so that you can very specifically control these diffusion tools so that the creativity is still coming from you. And from the models, all we get is, you know, automation of labor, like the uninteresting, non-fun part. Um, I think that, like, as we build tools, and I really do plan for to, to make Dingboard better at creating anime images that you specifically control and design yourself, like being able to draw things on the canvas and then have it like automatically spawn something. Um, I think that we're going to have more and more anime actually get created. Uh, you already see this happening with Blender and like really cool people, like people are like coming up with cool Blender workflows and comfy UI and stuff. Um, but unfortunately not everyone can like, you know, wrangle, uh, arc install and CUDA. So, uh, hopefully I can like ship something that can help bridge the gap for a lot of people. Uh, very exciting. Very, very exciting. There's so much, there's so much manga that needs to be anime, dude. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, I actually don't know. So I don't really like keep it. I, I need to, I, need, I actually need to set that up because of like, I'm, I'm hitting that point where I need to start reporting on GST. So I need to like know who's Canadian and who's not. <laughs> um, I I always wonder uh because in Japan um you know anime artists are actually very lowly paid uh it's it's yes. kind of like sub 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 one thousand yes. dollars a a month uh, kind of uh you know and a, a lot of piece work and absolutely abused like absolutely abused by the studios uh in fact when Netflix uh started its big anime push um it was even worse because the studios had a lot of contracts but they wouldn't pay anything above yep. e above the going piece rate. Uh, so there's is you know and, and people enter into it in with bees like with all this passion yes and then they find themselves you know in their mid-30s and they haven't you know living with the parents and you know uh, working like you know 18 hour days and uh for like 500 bucks a month right uh it, it is really really tragic um uh, and i i wonder i wonder w what is the bottleneck is the bottleneck i mean if they had better creation tools would they be able to create better or is it like is it the entire packaging and distribution is that is that really going to be the problem like even if you had better tools and the because it, and the the sad part is a lot of the artists they're the, the the part of the ai that we're putting out right now are the pieces that will um automate the uh the the the, the hand drawn uh, artistry while uh the storylines are still created by the you know i guess by the by the main creator or the studios or whatever so I, I I wonder how that transitions. Whether whether we actually get um, you know these these independents kind of being able to distribute to make and distribute on their own using AI. I, th I think that that's what I really hope happens. Is I hope that the crash in cost helps enable people to create their own anime and be able to own the whole production process, such that they capture like the actual creatives themselves capture more of the value rather than the you know engineered corporate system that is designed to like extract value from you know from these from the, from the, from these creative folks. A really good example, like a really good analogy of this is Dingboard itself would not exist if it wasn't for GPT-4. So if GPT-4 did not exist, I would not be able to learn how to write shaders to build an image editor in a game engine from scratch on a web browser. It is not normal that I was able it is not normal that I am able to I am able to claim that I can do that in two weeks. It isn't so this new version of Dingboard, I rewrote the whole user interface and the user interface library in like November. I just it was my third rewrite, I think. And the fact that I'm able to do that as a single developer, I am able to write so I have like these Twitter scripts. I promise you I'm not automating and advertising. What I do is to I use it to like automatically accept, you know, message requests and then it like launches me into directly into the message so I can like directly respond to people. So I've been able to like use GPT-4 to help me write code 
that can help me do support faster. Um, so what I can do then is I can bootstrap my company, whereas otherwise I would have had to call up these VCs and tell them, hey, uh, I'm going to turn Dingboard into uh, robots and then we're going to take over the world and it's going to be $1 trillion TAM. And instead of me having to do that, I can just like, you know, get the power of five, you know, software engineers by augmenting myself with GPT-4. And um, then I get to capture all the value as a creator of the, of the software. And I get to have a closer personal relationship and capital is less of a problem. Capital is less of a problem. So people just and generally overall end up becoming happier, right? So that's what I end up, I actually hope happens. And I think a lot of like the really early anime creators like really did it because they um, loved the craft itself. I don't think that the first ones did it because they knew it was a cash cow. It turned out to become a cash cow, which then had like these, you know, these large organizations for what, for, for what it's worth. I'm very grateful for because they've created many of the my 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 very fair favorite animes that I've very much enjoyed. Um, I think like the uh, yeah, so that's like you kind of see this already with uh, reality TV shows. I watch a lot of Minecraft YouTubers, like a lot of them. Like a, like that's what I'm going to do after this podcast. Is I'm going to go make dinner and watch Minecraft YouTubers, and it's this these and they own the whole they own the relationship with their customer, and it allows them to like it's so much more capital efficient. And it allows them to like create so much more value with so much less resources. It's actually quite incredible. Uh, we we already see this distribution happen with music and stuff. It's it's got these r- interesting weird like knock on effects. I think it's the uh, cause of what we call stuck culture, where you know the last common song that me and you know are probably is probably Drake or something because he was like one of the last artists before uh, the decentralization of like media distribution. Uh, now it's like, I listen to weird hyper pop that no one's listened to. And you probably listen to like some, some weird shit. No one else has listened to because you've like been put into like weird, weird. My last good song was the SpongeBob blorb song. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. Right. It's like, that's the last, you know, shared piece of culture because we were getting like super decentralized, but like, it's like this distributive effect of technology. Uh, I'm, I'm very, you know, uh, I have a friend who like will always like jokes like, oh, like you're so, te- you're so techno optimistic as a person who works in tech and uh, derives a lot of value from it. But I am, I am pretty like techno optimistic. So uh, hopefully that like relation to Dingboard is, is helpful. On another note, do uh, you think a lot of people in tech are actually techno pessimists? Um, I think so. I've met a lot of people. It's really funny, dude. Um, you meet these people who are like incredibly smart and then you start talking like, I mean, generally like pretty much everyone's very into ML and, and AI and direction that's going. And what, en- what ends up happening is like, I see this like thousand mile stare. They like, just like start, they like open their eyes like super wide and you're just like staring off in the distance, um, because they realize about the implications of like AI. So it's like pessimistic in a way. Um, I think that like. I, it's kind of hard for me to like judge the distributions, but I think I think it's easy to be optimistic when you're like making two million dollars a year and you're like in your Waymo, uh, and your Waymo is like effortlessly dodging all of the you know poor folks in San Francisco who are like uh, addicted to drugs, and you're like going through a two million tech job and you're like oh my god, I live in like a post scarcity world. Hell yeah, um, it's really easy to feel that way when you're like a very clean Waymo. Um, but I think yeah, like I, generally, I, I, I noted I noted that on your uh, bros is this post scarcity? Yeah, exactly. Like like bros. As the way more effortlessly dude. he navigates through the rough part of SF, where people are dying of sepsis towards dude. my two million dollar com AI researcher job. It's it's actually like pretty funny because it's like funny because it's true, right? Like it's like I was like so I mean I mean that tweet was inspired because I was hanging out with my friend, and we were going to meet other friends at a bar in San Francisco. And we just like walked through the rough part of town. We we're like two two burly guys, so like it was it was pretty fairly fairly like safe. I didn't feel that sketched out, but like the juxtaposition is just so funny. Like it's it's very 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 interesting. Like if you walk through like the Tenderloin or like the edge of Tenderloin into Hayes Valley, it's like the most one of the top ten experiences you can have because you go from this like horrible you know hellish landscape of squalor and death. And then you go into like this pretty beautiful, serene, hipster neighborhood, and you get like Greek food with your friends. Uh, fascinating. San Francisco is fascinating. Uh, yeah, person who is automating jobs. Yes, fuck yeah, hell, let's go techno optimism. Gonna auto yeah. my Waymo. The same person who got automated one year later. What the fuck? This fucking sucks. Where is my union? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I made that tweet after like uh, the whole like Devin thing popped off, which, for what it's worth, is like very impressive marketing uh, from from their point. Uh, I here I am talking about it on the podcast, but in general, people who like got like really upset about like oh like you know. Uh, automation for programming is coming. Oh no, I'm going to die and not be able to pay my bills. 
Uh, I have a general advice for people who are like really afraid of uh, automation. If you make your job fixing problems, you will never be automated. And if you are automated, if we've automated the thing, if we've automated the job of fixing problems, then we can automatically fix the problem of you not having a job. So just focus on fixing problems for people. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I saw that as well. If you're worried about Devin automating your programming job, maybe it's time to make your job fixing problems instead of rent seeking on your ability to code. Yes. Um, I, I generally like think that sometimes programmers have a little bit too much hubris uh, and overestimate their uh, self-value and connect it too much to their ability to program. And I think that programming inherently is like, like the actual act of like, you know, picking a programming language and like, you know, writing out code and stuff. It's, uh, I don't know, man, like don't be too attached to it. Like, I think the actual thing that matters is like fixing a problem. So like I could have been building Dingboard in isolation and like being like, oh, like cool ML models and stuff. But if I ship an ML model and I don't like actually make a feature that makes my users happy, then uh, it's actually just like a waste of my time. And I'm, I'm, I'm basically just like having fun and I shouldn't expect to derive any value from it. Right on. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you if there's a there's a Peter Thiel uh, comment uh, question. Uh, what do I believe that no one else does? Uh, what do I believe that no one else does? Uh, I. Um, I, I, I try not to have like too many beliefs. So uh, I actually don't know if there's anything that I actually believe that no one else does. Like I, I believe some stupid things because there's a lot of utility in having that belief. For example, like if you ask me, if you like actually corner me and ask me if uh, GPT-4 or any language model for that matter is conscious, I'll say yes. But if you also ask me if my computer right now not running any models is conscious, I will also say yes. And if you ask me like, is a banana conscious? I will say yes. But you know, a banana is more conscious than a rock. It seems like that, right? Um, so that's probably one thing I believe that no one else believes. And it's, it's very funny to like, actually, it's, it's, it's like ish, it's panpsychism, panpsychism ish. It's like, um, uh, the, like the whole like consciousness thing and like the sentience thing very like confuses me a lot. And the only way I can reconcile that confusion is by basically believing that, uh, anything that processes and in, processes information, uh, is, is sentient. So. Anything that processes information is sentient. It has to be, dude. Um, I, it, that's, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I've got. I'm kind of with you there. I'm kind of with you there. Uh, Bugit. Uh, I saw that uh, Eliezer Yudskowski had uh, blocked you. Yes. What 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 happened there? Like, what, have you had any interactions with him? What 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 has been the interactions with the donors? Um, you know, in the uh, you know, in the last like year, I guess. So I think like the first thing, so this is very long, like very much long time ago. So Rocco is pretty, like Rocco is pretty, is uh, kind of like a, I would call him, um, who's uh who's the lights years uh, antagonist? Who, who's, who, who's the protagonist of the lights here antagonist? I don't know. But anyways, like Rocco is like rock Rocco. Rocco is like the mini lights here. And uh, me and him had a Twitter debate about, you know, EAC versus, uh, you know, E slash stop, whatever they're calling themselves these days. So, and so I'm whole... gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just interrupt you for for a second, and like we're yep. we're talking about Rocco of Rocco's Basilisk, and, yeah, that guy. Um, and and I and I guess he he had a forum post about ten years ago where he said, "Well, you better be good because if not, in the future, an AGI is gonna come and abuse you if you were if you're talking bad stuff about AGIs." I I, I this is this is my perception. Of what it was, so he said that, yes. and that was Rock was Basilisk, yes. which is that a, a, a an AGI in the future would come back looking for you, yes. Um, and so you should you should be well behaved towards AIs and AGIs, yes. Uh, and that and that was basically how like Elon met Grimes by talking about Rock was Basilisk at some point. So ho, ho, ho. interesting. Uh, and 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 um, Belizer is kind of the uh, the uh, one of the leading lights of the. Uh, yay move an effective altruist mode of movement and they started to get worried about uh out of control agi about uh, 15 20 years ago and he's been uh he's a character he writes a lot about it i guess uh, he's written a lot about it and now that it's finally in the public eye he's got a much bigger platform uh he it, the surprising thing for me is eliezer is actually a transhumanist he's actually very very pro-technology but he's 
so he's not a Luddite, but he's very worried about AGI in particular, I guess. It's uh, yeah, it's like um, it's like pretty. He's a uh, I I, really, I like lights here. He's like super super consistent. Um, it's kind of easy for me to model him, and I like that. Um, and I think people like take this stuff way too seriously. So I think the reason lights here probably blocked me is because I was being a dipshit on the internet, which is pretty often. Um, but then I apologized and he unblocked me. Um, so I, I actually like like I, I like him. I think he's kind of cool and funny. I think that you shouldn't like take his views too seriously. It's very easy to like um, not act optimally if you uh, get paralyzed by fear. I think that like we're probably all going to be fine. To be honest, I'm not too worried. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm a believer in the slow takeoff. Um, but I, I like the. I like these. I like these folks. They're really fun. They're they're hilarious. They're like if you kind of like think about it, like the the you know the I wouldn't call them effect altruists, by the way. I would call them like the doomers. But the doomers are basically part of the same coin as the. EAC folks. They're just internet nerds who are, you know, internet addicted and they're hypothesizing about the future and getting really excited about it, you know, either excited or afraid, but definitely interested about it. Um, so that's kind of how like I view that stuff where um, it's like very, it's like fun. It's like all fun and games. I think some people take it a little bit too far. I think sometimes corporations co-opt it because it's like good for their, you know, uh, forever bottom line. Um, but like, I think like the, the, the folks are just like, you know, doing that stuff in isolation or mostly just having fun. Um, like I'll give you an example. Like I, I basically did this debate with Rocco on Twitter space and you see this like, you know, debate happen all the time with like, you know, Holtz, like, you know, George Hotz and, uh, not, not Holtz, George Hotz and, um, yeah, George you know, Connor. And yeah. Eliezer. And yeah, Eliezer, yeah. Connor, whatever, Connor, yeah. like one of those, you know, like nerds talking to each other and like smoking weed or something. And, um, I think like, so I basically like, uh, created this debate with Rocco on Twitter spaces and then. Um, I lost the debate. So often, well, well, when these debates will happen is I'll lose them. And I made a big, you know, ruckus on Twitter. Um, but what most people didn't know is that I actually like planned that whole thing with Rocco from the very get go. It's like, Hey, like, you know, message Rocco. And it's like, Hey, like, let's like make this big debate and like, like, make, like, like, let's make a big stink about it. I'll pretend to lose. I had a pre-recorded conversation of like, uh, my wife, you know, yelling at me or something. And I played it during the Twitter space and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I, I think you should like not take those debates too seriously. Like basically like as a listener, right? Like just like if it's not entertaining, stop listening to it. It's dumb. Uh, people just like talk over each other. Uh, you know, conversations are, are, are better purpose for like understanding each other. Like we're like being able to model each other better. Um, but don't try to like convince other people who cares, dude. It's not like, it's not like we can actually do anything. Like my position is like, Bro, like technology is like water. Okay. Technology, once you invent it, it'll fill every single crack that it can to make people's lives easier. That's what happens. And it's going to keep on getting better. And you just need to learn how to adapt how to adapt. Like, you know, like set up the VTuber, you know, podcast thing. Like figure out how to like, you know, do some face track. Like, you know, like ride the tiger, because we don't have a choice, bro. The tiger's coming. It'll eat you, dude. Get on. <laughs> 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 ride the tiger indeed um yes. you know what would you want out you know if you if you if, if you, you could, could just like close, close your, your eyes, eyes for a second, second and think about let's say a uh, ding board in 12 months what would you want it to be okay i'm closing my eyes i'm thinking about ding board um I would like to have a lot more users. Uh, I would love to have a lot more users. And I would like to have a lot more features that makes it like useful. Like I want everyone to be using this thing, dude. I want every fucking person on the planet to be using this thing. I want, you know, MS Paint. Remember MS Paint, dude? MS Paint was so good, dude. Remember MS Paint? Man, I fucking miss MS Paint, dude. Remember this? You could just like do things. You could just like make a happy face. And it was always there for you when you needed it. But now we're all running MacBooks and Linux and no one uses, uses Windows anymore. I want people, I want this. I want this thing. I want Dingboard to occupy occupy the same space as this thing. I want Dingboard to be like, basically, you know, I want Dingboard to be basically exactly this. Where you just load Dingboard, it's like there immediately. You, you can make an image super fast. It has you know cool new features to make it that make it a little bit better than MS Paint. And I want like you know at least I'll be happy if I have a billion users, a billion with a B. I'll be very happy if I have a billion users, a billion. I want people to be like, oh dude, just like use Dingboard. Like, were, were you fucking? Dude, don't like creative cloud. Forget about that. Just like go to dingboard.com and just like use dingboard. It like works so easily. Like you can, you can do so many cool things on dingboard. Um, so that's, that's where I want to take it. Uh, basically I want it to like take real estate in people's head heads. Um, I want to be able to like, you know, 
just have people like um use dingboard um like you know what i mean it's like it's like more of like a like a thought space thing it's not i'm not really really like i'm like somewhat financially motivated but like not super financially motivated yeah hopefully that answers your question so just you- just for just for uh, uh li- listeners who are not on video um uh, yasin just uh took an anime image uh drew a, a pink uh pink brush over the eyes of the character and uh placed a um ai placed a, a pair of sunglasses yep uh, which fit, fits fits for fits for directly into the animation uh exactly pretty dude. impressive in, just, in the last just like, make 20, something, 20, just, 20 seconds yeah just make something that's like not dog shit there you go i'm wearing sunglasses bro that's that's it we're done right like that's what i want i want i want people to use it i want people to like i, I want users bro that's what i want yeah okay Uh, I was on Cloudflare and I was just putting in random words and uh, ding. I like write console.log dingus when I'm debugging JavaScript software. Um, and I was like, oh, I, I, that's my debug word. So ding is my debug word. And um, that's, and then I was like, holy shit, ding, no one's bought the ding board. It's like fucking seven bucks. I'm copying this right now. Uh, so d- ding board, you can actually, I could probably dig up the tweet and send it to you, but like I started building ding board um when i was watching a movie with my wife and i asked chat gpt4 to like just generate me a scene and that i can drag images around because i just needed it that's how i started amazing um i love i i mean it had a little bit of a learning curve for me uh i've, I've used it like I, I used it yesterday i hit thirty-five thousand followers yesterday on twitter amazing and, and uh i was very excited um and i used ing board i had the at the wojak's Two Wojaks, uh, you know, pointing, Dude, what a pointing great, at a what a great meme. color. What a great meme! I love yeah. the Wojak meme. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I had I had them pointing at it. Um, actually, no, it was the Soy Boys. It was the Soy Boys pointing pointing at the thirty five k. Um, it was a uh, yeah. It was it was it was fun. It was good to use. Um, I I'd actually, you know, I've tried to use um Adobe a few times in my life, and I've always gotten like you know you you know you have to hit this. You're, there's a learning curve and you have to hit that one learning curve where you have to like push through in order to like le- relearn how to do something. Yeah. And then if not, you kind of get discouraged, right? And then once yeah. you get discouraged, you're like, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> exactly. And you you ask someone else to do it or you're like, you know what? It's not that important. Like, you know, you're, you're hire someone, you ask a friend or whatever, or, you, or, you, or you're like, oh, right? And uh, I've definitely faced that with Adobe a few times. Um uh, never learn how to uh you know uh edit an image uh, in adobe uh it, it's just too complex for me and it's it's just a bit crazy right like i am i am machine learning developer i have like you put a notebook running here and you know et cetera, et cetera, and whatever but i think all of us you know you you look at a new new form of software or a new new vertical of software and even though you're very literate you can like you know do do I have the activation energy to get get over it or not? And the yeah, activation energy for Adobe is high. It's friction. Right? It's friction, dude. It's like like the actual loading of the Adobe homepage takes longer to load than Dingboard itself, and then you have to click through and then you have to buy it, and you have to like click through five different options. So like, oh, like are you a student? Are you going to pay us a thousand dollars? Do you want the option to get you know a cancellation fee? It's all this friction to like actually just use the software. And then when you land in the software, dude, there's like five thousand buttons. Why are there so many goddamn buttons? Just I'm just trying to fucking make an image. I'm trying to paste two images together and add a transparency layer. Like why are there so many goddamn options? And that's the thing I'm trying to avoid with Dingboard. So you you said something which was like it took me a while to like figure out how to use it. And that's something I'm actually trying to fix. And that's something I'm treating as a bug. So I treat like. I watch people very keenly when they start using Dingboard and I try to understand uh, the new users when they drop what they're trying to figure out to do and how they're doing it from their perspective. And because I'm running this in a game engine, I think I can do things like actually have an edit literally get played out in the game engine, in the events of the game engine, and then show you how to do it. And then like there's like other things like I can like you know, pre-segment things and then like, you know, highlight them so that like guiding people to click on them. Ideally, there are no buttons on Dingboard, right? The fact that there are buttons at all is actually kind of kind of crappy. Um, so ideally, there should be no buttons at all. It should just work. Um, like the less buttons, the better. And it's actually been quite difficult for me to add features because it like, I'm very against that, like adding complexity. So, so uh, I, I think like uh, it's like uh, important to like mention like the VTuber thing, right? Like this is pretty cool. Like I, why are you i guess i have a question for you i I, uh, hopefully you have the time for it but why are you like running vtuber as a 
um, as as a person, uh, you know, do, running the podcast. And so, so some background context is I set up this VTuber thing like today, like an hour ago or two hours ago at this point. So, uh, wh- why did you choose? Okay, so, so, so both of us, both of us are running a VTuber. I'm I'm running a Unreal Meta Human. Uh, you have an, you have a much way cooler like anime anime <laughs> avatar. Um, I th- I think my my background for it was um, I I am I'm semi box like a bunch of people already know uh, who I am. There's there's no real there's no real reason. Um, I think you know for me it's about information delivery. Um, right. Is information delivery uh, more efficient, uh, more fun? Uh, is the is the package that you're receiving you know uh, more worthwhile? Uh, you know watching or listening to right? And I think uh, eight eight is not me right eight eight yeah. is eight is a persona i i play right and uh the interesting thing about eight is you know um it, it it's purely on what i've written it was created purely out of uh stuff i've written down yeah uh, rather than uh from kind of like reputation or etc 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 and for me that was very important because um it, it was kind of proving out kind of like uh, the writing, proving out the themes, proving out the ideas, without having this attachment of like your ego or your reputation, where you went to school, or you know all of these things, right? And I, I that was very important for me. Um, and I decided to just go where, where you know the wind was kind of blowing me, right? Because um, I never, you know, eight, eight, this was a shit post account, and it just kind of got pulled out, right? Like. When I wrote something that you know was interesting and people responded to it, I, I wrote more about it. And uh, and the eight character, you know, tons of people know that I'm actually a guy, right. and uh, b- a bunch of people I think know that you know I went to Stanford and I have a electrical engineering degree, and right. I actually didn't talk about that for a very very long time until their account really kind of blew up. That's fascinating because you because earlier you were saying like it's a video game for you, so you're like. It's like rolling a new character, right? It's like basically like rolling RPG from start from the start, and you you shed away all of your um, all of the baggage that you've got. That like is basically like you're you're rolling from the start. It's like you're running a new new run, and your your armor is all dog shit again, and you're like b- b- building up from this. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. And um, it was it was actually uh, you know um, it actually started about because Balaji Srinivasan he wrote about you know pseudonymous um, kind of characters, etc. Okay. And that kind of drove me to set up eight uh, in the first place, right. and um, and then and then and then it just you know I I, I never expected their account to get this big, I yeah. never expected to be doing a podcast in the in the role of E, uh, it just it just kind of happened, and um, yeah and and you know if if the information delivery mechanism is good because the the other thing is you know I'm very conscious as I said before that podcasts are an audio product. And so, uh, one of the reasons I do a, um, a, a, a female voice is because, uh, I believe that, um, you know, when you, when you listen to a podcast, it's like 80% of male voices Yeah. and the audience is also kind of 80% male, which is kind of unusual because normally, um, you know, guys can to listen to female voices more often, right? Like there's, yeah. it's more, it like, it penetrates more. So, so I was thinking you know, just remarkable your perspective. Why not? You know, I already have the eight character. And I was like, it'll be really cool to like instantiate, like manifest eight out of thin air. And, you know, eventually a long chip in VR, right? So I'm like, you know, is it actually possible? And so we're actually using a fair bit of technology. It's an unreal meta human and, you know, That's, a bunch of stuff yeah, going on. There's when you told me that, involved. when you told me your setup was like the, probably the coolest thing ever. I think like that's actually like, um, when you reached out to me to do this podcast, I actually like was super excited because I saw that you were like setting up a like VTuber thing and it got me because I've always wanted to set up one before, like, and it kind of like helped me help motivate me to do it. And I don't know. I think it's cool. It's, I think it's fun. I think it's like quirky. I think it's like, I, I think you should keep on doing it. I really like that. It's really cool. Um, and you should definitely like share like how you've done it to other people because I think the technology itself is like pretty awesome. Yeah. We're, 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 I think, I think, you know, the, the interesting thing is I have some sense of where the tech is going, right? Yeah. So I know that within 12 months, this is going to be even better. And yeah. so I also have this, I also do a bunch of things like a little bit early, earlier in the curve because yeah, I like, know that I am, I am early in the curve, right? So yeah. I know that this is going to become, this tech is going to become so much better in like 12 months, 12, 18 months. And I'll be able to show this character progression uh, over time. Right? That's awesome. So, That's so cool, dude. 
That's actually so cool. That's awesome, dude. So, yeah. So I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm excited. the The voices worked out much better than I thought. Uh, I it's actually great. prefer uh, yeah, listening the, to the eight female voice over over my own. I was um, I was really impressed I, with the voice actually when I first heard it. I was like, wow, that's actually really cool. Yeah, I I actually I actually put a fair amount of like listening listening and tweaking and you know getting getting it right. And I have, you know, uh, I have uh, Python uh, you know things running to clean up the noise, do noise reduction. And I uh, like you, I learned a bunch of things off QPD four, and I have a high Hell pass yeah, low pass filter running and like Amazing. fitting up the audio. And I have a, I I had a. I had a um, um, you know uh, browser login, uh, browser automation to kind of get the voices swapped, and then you know Eleven Labs put out a uh, API, so now I'm using the API. I set up the API nice. yesterday. They got a bunch of stuff running. There's like a bunch of like peck running. That's <laughs> amazing. Some, and, so, and you know, some so of which cool I have like, debug. Dude, it's so know? cool how like GPT four basically like made that possible for you, right? For, I mean, for me too, it's like, it was like, I don't know, I think I messaged you 11.30 and then like 12 p.m. I had like face tracking running and then like, at like, like I think like 1 p.m. I had this like avatar set up and like, like I'm running this on Linux. I'm like piping it through OBS and then back to Chrome. There was a bunch of shit I had to fix. But like GPT-4 is just incredible for like reducing the friction for doing just like awesome shit like this. Yeah, you just Hell need yeah, intention and perseverance, right? Exactly. You, just you just need, need those agency, two things. Dude. You don't need skill. You yes. don't need skill in the middle, you know, you need, you need to just actually just do the thing, dude. Like it's it's so simple. I don't understand why more people don't do it. It's like, it's it's like back to what you're saying about like why why don't like VC companies just like compete with ding boards? Like I don't understand, dude. I actually don't un- I don't know. <laughs> That's really cool, man. Keep I, it up. I, That's really cool. There, there, there's there's a risk that there's this there's this accumulation energy in your in your mind about like taking taking a risk of doing something new, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, that that that's hard. That's hard for I think a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that I think, um, in, in AI also people know, understand that change is coming and a lot of people just won't like change in general. Yeah. I, um, while some people thrive on it and yes. are absolutely, you know, uh, insane, uh, you know, seeking, seeking new things and seeking um, like fame. Amazing. Yeah. Very cool, man. That's very cool. Like, yeah, like definitely kudos. Like it's, 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 I'm definitely excited about your podcast. Emergent Behavior is a part of the Turpentine Network. For our full newsletter, visit emergentbehavior.co. For more Turpentine podcasts and sponsorship inquiries, visit turpentine.co.